Uh, Pio Pico was um, born in California in 1801. And at this time, it was uh, part of the Spanish Empire. So um, he was born a, a, a Spanish uh, a citizen. And so um, he actually lived in California. What's interesting about him, he's lived in California his whole life. And he was born a Spaniard. He lived as a, a young adult and into his uh, middle age as a Mexican. And he died as a US citizen without ever leaving uh, Southern California. So um, he lived almost the entire uh, 19th century, and so his life is very indicative of all the changes that the state uh, has went through during that time period. So um, it's interesting about uh, Pio Pico. A lot of people uh, look at him as a, sort of a re revolutionary, um, and this is uh, partially true. Uh, but it's also partially true that Pio Pico was uh, very much an opportunist. He was a, a business person. He loved power. Um, and he wrestled power from, from various people throughout his life. And so the story um, is, is very complicated because uh, as a politician, he's mostly known as a politician, but that was a very brief portion of his life. And what I discovered as, as I was doing the research is that his business life was much more um, full than just that small portion of, of, of politics. Let me get my water real quick. So, he was born in Mission San Gabriel, which is just right outside east of Los Angeles. And um, this was, uh, he was born there because his father was a guard there. Uh, his father uh, was born in Sinaloa, Mexico, and he came as a young uh, man with his father, Santiago de la Cruz Pico. Santiago was a, a group of, um, he came with a group of settlers who uh, founded California um, from that area. Uh, they were coming from uh, an expedition uh, by a man named Juan Bautista de Anza. You might know, uh, have heard of the Anza Trail. Um, and this is the trail that they took from uh, northern Mexico, through Sonora, Sinaloa, and came up through Arizona crossed over from Yuma into San Diego and then went up the, the state. Um, this happened in 1775 and 1776. So as the United States was fighting for independence, uh, the Spaniards were sort of concentrating their power um, in, this, uh, in this region. And they feared various things. They feared uh, the emerging uh, United States. They feared Great Britain. They feared the French. Uh, and so they wanted to secure California. California was sort of the last place in terms of their land base that they needed to secure. Okay. Um, thank you. That was easy. Focus on the The key still the key and then the uh, little, uh, I think it's F5. Five. 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 You never remember that one. This is the Mission San Gabriel. Now, um, 
His father Santiago, uh, or his grandfather Santiago de la Cruz, uh, settled in what is uh, Santa Barbara. He had four sons, and each of those sons settled um, a lot in the various regions of California. There are Picos in, uh, that settled in San Jose as well. And there's some that settled in places like uh, San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara, and others in Southern California. So the Pico uh, family was spread throughout the, um, the state. Uh, Pio becomes the most prominent one. These are people who are uh, very, uh, have very little means. Uh, Santa de la Cruz Pico was uh, a soldier, and uh, he wasn't an officer either, so he was making very little money. The Spanish government, wasn't really sending uh, a lot of uh, uh, supplies or funds either. Uh, by the time independence came around, the Pico family was owed a lot of money they never got uh, for their service. But um, in Pio Pico's, uh, he, he dictated a uh, memoir uh, to a historian after the U.S. conquest in about the 1870s, and he said that he was born in this area in a, a shack made of sticks, kind of similar to what the Gabriel Indios uh, Indians were, were using, you can see here. But um, the mission guard was placed there uh, because the indigenous population, obviously, they were, um, even though a lot of them uh, liked what was happening, a lot of them also resisted. There was constant resistance because they were not allowed to um, practice their, their traditional religion, they were not allowed to speak their languages and stuff, and, and, and so forth, so there was constant uh, um, resistance. That's why they needed to have soldiers at the, each of the missions. There are also larger presidios that would um, uh, be sort of a, a, um, a larger military base that would cover or protect a region. So um, one of the things that these soldiers wanted to do, California is a huge piece of land, is that they were hoping that because of their service they would somehow get a ranch and they would be able to start a family and, and make some money and so forth. So that's what all, uh, most of the soldiers were hoping for, including Pio Pico's um, father, Jose Maria uh, Pico. Um, Jose Maria Pico, uh, in 1785, um, we know that he spoke the indigenous language here. I'm not sure how he learned it. But um, what I discovered is that he overheard a conversation between some of the indigenous people of a plot to kill the Spaniards and drive them out of Southern California and hopefully um, uh, start a larger revolution of indigenous people against the Spaniards. And um, he knew very, uh, very good details about the plot, when it was going to happen, how it was going to happen, and so forth. And so uh, he told his superiors that and they were able to foil the plot of the indigenous people. And so Pio, uh, Pio Pico's father, Jose Maria Pico, was celebrated by the Spanish government for having done this, this deed. Okay? So um, this is what he thought was going to happen. Okay? I'm celebrated, I'm going to get a, a rank of an officer, and then they're going to give me some land, and I'll be a wealthy person. Um, so five years later, in, um, in 1790, um, the Spanish government did a census, and it's a very interesting, you can buy, you can actually buy the book, The Census of 1790 in California. Uh, it's a little pamphlet, and it shows all the different people who lived here in all of the areas. And Pio Pico's family is spread out through the state, his, um, his um, uncles, and it lists, in these, these census, it lists what is called the caste of the person. The caste is what your racial makeup is. You can go to the next slide. Oh, that was the school. Cool. Let's go back. All right. Can you put that on his lap? Mm. Yeah. It should be able to just move forward with the uh, down arrow. <laughs> That's what I hit. <laughs> oh, there we go. go. There, there we go. go. Okay. So <laughs> the Spaniards had this very uh, bizarre. Uh, categorization of your race based on the mixture of three different races, uh, indigenous, black, and white. And depending on uh, who you married and where you set, uh, stood in that, it was a racial hierarchy called the caste system or the caste system. And those uh, people who were on the top of the caste system had more rights and privileges in society than those on the bottom. So the way it worked, of course, is that indigenous and black people were at the very bottom, 
and that the white Spaniards were on the top. And so all the mixtures of those three races were in the middle. Okay? So um, also the way it worked is that they had these names that were put on your birth certificate according to what racial makeup you had. And so if you're a white person, you married a black lady, your child would be called a mulatto. And so the mulatto has uh, less privileges than the father, but more privileges than the mother. You see how that works. So the, the lesson is, is that you're going to marry correctly and you're, you'll move up and your, child, your children will have more privileges in society. It was kind of a sinister way to give the Spaniards all the power in society. So if we can hit the next one. I hit the right button. I can't yeah. see it from there. Okay, so then uh, that Monaco grows up and she marries a white person and then their child is a Morisca, which is a, a, a person of one quarter African blood. And so that person right there has more privileges than the mother, but still less than the father. So again, uh, gaining more privilege. You go ahead and hit the next one. And then that Morisca grows up and um, marries. Yes. Why does the girl have less privileges than her father? Because she's, she's one quarter and he was one half. The father was pure, pure. Spaniard. Spaniard. The mother was. I thought it was that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So this uh, this person is one eighth black um, and albino, right? Um, and so again, less privileges than the mother, or more privileges than the mother, less than the father. Go ahead and go forward. And then what happened was very strange. This person right here is 116th black. Um, and their past is called torna atrás, which means to move backwards. So this is very similar to the one drop rule in US history, uh, which uh, dictated in the United States that if you, even if you have one drop of African blood, you still um, are considered black and you have less privileges in society. So this is the same thing. You don't actually move forward, you turn back. You regress, okay? So the, the, the idea is that in, in this racist system, of course, is that you can never rid yourself of the African ancestry. For indigenous people, uh, if, you fo if they follow the same pattern, moving, uh, uh, marrying white through the generations, they eventually get to a point after four generations where they simply become a Spaniard. But for the black, because of uh, slavery and so forth, which existed here, you could never uh, rid it from you whereas the indigenous population could. The, 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 the lesson here learned is, of course, is that um, unless you have more European blood in, in you, uh, you will never amount to much. Okay? Um, and it, like I said, there were so few Spaniards uh, that this was a great way of, of, of letting society know who had the power. Okay? So the Pico family, the Pico sons, were all labeled mulatos. Okay? Uh, and this gets back to my uh, question about the census of 1790. Pio Pico's father was, uh, was listed as mulatto um, on his birth certificate, but in the census of 1790, he was listed as a Spaniard, mm -hmm. whereas his brothers were listed as mulattos. <laughs> How did that happen? Well, it goes back to these documents can be falsified. They can be changed. Your caste can go up. It wasn't an exact system. Um, what I suppose happened is that everybody knew that uh, his birth certificate said uh, uh, Mulatto, why did it change in the census? This is because of the plot in 1785 that he uncovered at Mission San Gabriel. He was given a gift by the Spanish government of being listed as a Spaniard, which would put him in a position of power of prestige, of the ability to gain land and uh, a promotion as an officer in the Spanish military. Okay. Can we um, go to the next one? Um, just the, the, the plot is very much, or the casa system is very different if you, if you don't marry um, into European. This is a marriage between an indigenous person and a black person. As you can see, compared to the other pictures, they're not, they're not the owners of those estates. They are laborers on this. And a, the caste of an indigenous and a black person is called a lobo. Who knows what that means in, in what's a wolf? So your what your product your product is not even human, it's an animal. Okay? So you can see the, the, the absolute 
um, horrible, uh, the psychological trauma that this must have put on people of Latin America. This didn't only exist in Mexico, but also all the way down to Argentina and the Caribbean as well. Okay, next slide. Okay. So here's Pio Pico, uh, a little bit older. Um, let me, before I get into his early political career, let me tell you what happened to his father. Uh, his father was heading in the right direction after uh, foiling the plot of the indigenous people, uh, but he ran into uh, the movement of Mexican independence. Started in 1810. Uh, California wasn't really involved too much of, uh, uh, in that, but a lot of the uh, soldiers heard about what was happening, and Pio Pico's father sided with the insurgents. And he was imprisoned, and this, um, because of that, uh, he was taken, all of his privileges were taken away. So Pio Pico's father died right before Mexican independence was realized in about 1819. And Pio Pico uh, wrote that my father died without giving us even an inch of land. Hmm. And so um, Pio Pico emerges as a young man at the head of a family of nine sisters and a younger brother. Uh, they're living in San Diego at this point, and now you have Mexican independence. Even according to the Constitution at this point, uh, it states that you must be a landowner in order to uh, run for public office. So how did this happen? So Pio Pico was industrious, even as a young man. He had all these sisters, right? He started a little shop in, San, in, in the old town area of San Diego, and he sold blankets and shoes and shots of whiskey and trade, uh, played cards and, and gambled. And eventually he was able to buy a little house in the uh, plaza there of San Diego. And he entered politics about 1826. And his, uh, his success was just skyrocketed. Um, I couldn't find any other reason to understand how he was so successful except for the fact that all of his sisters married powerful men. And those, uh, because of his sisters uh, telling their husband, take my brother and lead him by the hand and give him some prominence, uh, this is really the only uh, way that I can see that he, um, he emerged. Uh, the Mexican government outlawed the caste system. So um, in Mexican society, it's much different than here. No matter what race you are, you're just Mexican. And so there's not, there's not that distinction of black uh, Mexican, white Mexican, indigenous Mexican. So um, all those uh, distinctions were, were taken away. So he had an even playing field. He could enter politics. Even though there were still racist elements in society, uh, they couldn't affect him legally. So he won the city council election in 1826. Uh, by about 1828, he decides to run for the statewide, it's called the Diputación, but it's, it's basically the Senate uh, of California, and he wins that election. Um, he is, um, if you look at the people by about 1830 that are sitting on the statewide Senate, they're all people who are intermarried. They're uh, people who, uh, their sons and daughters are, 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 are married with one another. They're, is a very small group of people who emerges uh, from families of soldiers. And so um, Pio Pico is in this group. He gets his first ranch in, um, in 1829, and it's a small ranch compared to others, it's 8,000 acres. It's uh, a Rancho Hamul, which is in eastern uh, um, San Diego County. And um, from there, he stocks it with livestock, and he begins uh, 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 to become a, a business person. The, the way to make money in California at this time was through uh, cattle. Um, people were selling hides, they were selling tallow. There were a lot of companies coming from um, New York and, and um, South America who were uh, trading with the Californians. Uh, and uh, Pio Pico is, uh, um, is part of this. So, um, how does he be, go into the next level? And this has to do with Mexican politics. Very, it's kind of complicated. Mexico has its constitution written in 1824, and they model it after a, a, a republic in a, a republic like the United States. Um, there are uh, these con what they call conservatives. It's not like our conservatives here in Mexico who want more of a centralized government, meaning kind of like a, a person like a king or a dictator who will rule over everything. But there's the other faction who, who 
really likes what the U.S. did, and they want representative democracy, they want state rights. And the people in California obviously want state rights because they want to control their own land. So um, in 1829, the government changes, the, the, the conservatives take over, and they're very, they don't like state rights, and so they send a governor uh, called Mariano Chico to govern over California, and he's basically messing with, the, with these new group of, uh, of people like Pio Pico, um, saying you guys can't um, give yourselves land and all these privileges, you have to come through me. And so Pio Pico starts a revolution. Based in San Diego, it's called the Plan of San Diego. He gets all the top families together, and he basically sends this, this governor packing. So Pio Pico, he's about 31 years old now, and as the, um, uh, at this point, he's the, he's the senior person in the California Senate, or the Diputacion, and um, he kicks out this, this appointed governor from California, and uh, the, the Senate makes him the new governor of California. He's only interim, he's, he lasts there for about two weeks until a replacement comes, but he's established himself in his early 30s as one of the top five politicians in California. From there, the, the land bases just keep growing. He acquires more and more land. Um, by the time um, <clears throat> the United States is beginning to look seriously at California, he's got tens of thousands of acres. Here's Pio Pico. This photo was, um, this is his wife in the middle and his two nieces. This photo was probably taken about 1855, 1856. Um, you can see he's not, I mean, he's a, a person of, uh, of great wealth in this photo. So um, eventually Pio Pico, if you can go to the next slide, this is, this is a, this is sort of a doctor photo. That's his wife of an older age. This is probably taken about 1860. Next photo. So um, one of the things that the Californians do is they, they're involved in something called secularization. And Pio Pico is basically the head of this. Um, they want to take the power away from the church. Um, if you, some historians said you could walk from San Diego to San Francisco along the coast without leaving church land. Okay. Uh, this may be a slight exaggeration, but they owned the, the bulk of the land. And so the California said, what are you guys using this for? All you're doing is um, accumulating this land. You're not really doing anything with it. Uh, so what the plan was for secularization was to take the power of, this, of the missions away from the missionaries, uh, make the, turn these into churches and schools, for the, uh, the community and to distribute the land to uh, the citizens of the state. First, indigenous people who were living the, the neophytes who were being um, uh, missionized at these places, and then to the citizens of, uh, of California. This process took about um, 10 years, and Pio Pico, as uh, governor of California in 1845, he finally signed the last uh, papers to secularize the mission systems in California. Next slide. This, just, this is just the Mission San Luis Rey. It gives you an idea of, uh, of the buildings here. A lot of these, if you, if you go to some of the missions, I'm not sure how the, the one out here are, but in San Francisco, most of these buildings are gone. They've been they've crumbled, and just the church is left. But the missions were, were massive uh, institutions that did all kinds of things. They had, uh, obviously, orchards and, and lands that they grazed cattle on. But there was a lot of workshops in here where, where they made things like shoes and, and, and blankets and whatnot. Next one. This is a picture of Pio Pico's brother, Andres. And um, he was uh, his, his younger brother. And um, he was very prominent uh, before and even after the US um, takeover. So Pio Pico becomes governor in 1844 as a result of another uh, revolution that he didn't lead, but he was involved in, sending a conservative government back to Mexico City again and wrestling power. For a time, they declared California independent from Mexico. Um, that less, lasted less than a year. Um, but really, nobody in 1844, nobody really wanted to be uh, governor because they all knew what was happening. 
They, could, they, they knew that um, the Texans declared themselves uh, independent three years before and, and eventually um, the United States was going to come and, and take that uh, away as well. In 1845, the United States annexes Texas. Um, Mexico never relinquished control of Texas, and so they, con they considered it um, theft of their property. And so people were not envious of Pio Pico because they felt that the same thing was going to happen to California. During his time of, in, in office, California was in chaos. People up here in the north, you guys know who Jose Castro was. He was the head of the military. He hated Pio Pico, even though his, one of his family members was married to Pio Pico's uh, cousin. Um, and so those two, Pio Pico in the south and Jose Castro up here, were marching towards each other to, to fight a battle uh, when they heard about the Bear Flag Revolt when John Fremont captures um, one of the, uh, the Vallejos and um, raises the U.S. flag. And of course, eventually, war is declared between the two uh, countries. Next slide. So um, I'm not going to go too much into war, but just to say that the United States put a lot of incredible effort into this. It was a short war. It lasted a couple of years. Um, Mexico was. Uh, in chaos at the time. There were internal problems with the government. There was a massive indigenous rebellion in Yucatan at the time. Uh, and the, the United States government definitely um, occupied all of the ports of Mexico. Pio Pico uh, was ordered to flee into the interior of Mexico City. And then um, uh, there was a few battles in California. Um, his, Pio Pico's brother Andres was the leader of the military. He defeated the, the, the U.S. troops at San Pascual, as you can see up there near San Diego. And they also drove them out temporarily from Los Angeles. But the United States definitely saw California as the prize of the war. It would open up trade with the Orient. Uh, you had massive um, uh, ability for uh, the San Francisco Bay was the biggest harbor on the Pacific coast. And so they really wanted California um, more than anything. And so they, they sent a lot of warships there. Uh, and the, the war in California actually ended a year before the, the entire war did. Mm -hmm. uh, California relinquished control in 1847, and the war ended in 1848. And so, um, <clears throat> nevertheless, um, the, the war was over, and they signed what is called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo which gave the United States as punishment, they punished uh, uh, Mexico and they said, we're going to take one half of your land base. So half of Mexico was taken for losing a war. It's kind of crazy. If you can imagine that happening today, the United States defeating a country in, in a war and then saying, okay, I'm going to take half of your country. Uh, they did pay them 10 million bucks, uh, but that's not uh, enough money for the land from San Francisco all the way to uh, the border of uh, Texas. Okay. Next slide. So at this point, in 1848, Pio Pico returns into California from Mexico. Um, Mexico was militarily occupied, but it, it wasn't a state yet, it was still considered a, a territory. So the U.S. government uh, militarized it. Um, Finally, after the gold rush, and so many people came in, um, they had a constitutional convention and it became a state in 1850, immediately because of so many people. Whereas New Mexico and, and Arizona, they remained territories until they gained the, the, the population qualifications. But as he was going through uh, California, um, he passed through his lands, which were extensive, that he had gained as a politician. So if you look here, um, you can see Rancho Hamur. This was his 8,000 acre ranch. Uh, going up towards, um, where is Escondido? Towards Poway. His brother-in-law owned uh, Rancho San Antonio, which is basically Ramona. His other uh, brother-in-law owned um, Rancho San uh, Peñasquitos, which is near Rancho Bernardo and Poway. Um, <coughs> going up, 
Uh, this, what, the purple area, which is Camp Pendleton, that entire thing right there was Pio Pico's ranch. Um, it was 134,000 acres. Next slide. Going into, San, uh, in, into uh, Los Angeles County, over here, Los Coyotes. His brother was the owner of the 121,000 acre Rancho San Fernando. Rancho Simi was uh, owned by his, uh, his father, or his uh, uncles. Um, and eventually, a couple of years later, um, Pio Pico purchases Paso de Bartolo, which he calls Ranchito, which means a little ranch. And it was a small ranch, but it was, again, 8,000 acres. So Pio Pico, um, even though the United States took over, uh, his family owned about 700,000 acres of land. Um, and even though there was a lot of tension at this time between Mexicans and, and uh, the newcomers who came from the East Coast, um, Pio Pico was uh, as wealthy as anybody in the state. Okay. Um, and he did have a stake in the gold, in the gold uh, fields, but that's not how he made his money. Um, Pio Pico stocked all of his land with uh, cattle and he fed all those 49ers. He fed them beef, he sold beef to large uh, uh, companies, he sold blankets, made tallow, and by about 1853, Pio Pico was uh, the equivalent of a multimillionaire. He was one of the wealthiest and most powerful individuals in the state. Um, the, the Supreme Court um, looked at Pio Pico there saying, this guy's an anomaly. What are we going to do with Pio Pico? Um, even though California entered the Union as a free state, uh, it, was run, it was controlled by Democrats. Who The Democrats, if you remember your Civil War history, they were very much pro-slavery, pro-Southern, although there were some in the North. Um, they, they dominated politics in California during this time. And they had these outlandish laws that came in, like blacks couldn't uh, homestead public land, go to public schools and whatnot. And so they said, here's Pio Pico, and he looks like a black man, and yet he owns all this land. What are we going to do about it? You know? Well, really, they couldn't do anything. Because under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexicans gained U.S. citizenship. They're the first non-Caucasian uh, group to, to be granted citizenship. Although a lot of them were, uh, a lot of Mexicans were in fact Caucasian, there were others like Pio Pico who were mixed. Um, so Pio Pico uh, was immediately uh, attacked. Um, a lot of people began to try to wrestle the land from, from the Californios. Um, California passed something in 1851 called the Land Act, the California Land Act. It required Mexican landowners to prove that they actually own their land. So they had to go to some court in San Francisco, and they had to hire lawyers and interpreters and surveyors of their land and bring all kinds of maps and prove all this stuff. And if you couldn't, your land is going to be taken away from you and given to the public domain. And so Pio Pico was able to uh, survive this process, whereas most uh, Mexican landowners did not. Um, during this process, which lasted about 15 years, uh, the vast majority of the ranches of California were broken up uh, because the landowners didn't have the money. Uh, there was so much litigation, property taxes came up. Plus, there was a law that was passed in California called squatter's rights, which meant that until you prove it's your land, a squatter can go on your ranch, start building uh, a home, um, fence in an area, use the water that's going in there, build orchards and bring in cattle, and he's not, you're not going to be able to kick him out until you have a paper that says you own it. And so and after, and after you prove it, then you have to pay that individual for any improvements he made to your land. And so in this, in this process, it was just too much for most Californians. But, but Peel People was making uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, at this point, to bring a lawsuit uh, all the way through, through multiple um, what do you call it when you appeal? Appeals. It would cost a, a person about seventy-five dollars. 
Today, that's nothing. But back then, $75, most people didn't have that kind of money. It was a, it was a large sum of money for the average uh, U.S. citizen at that point. But for Pio Pico, it was just absolutely nothing. It was just it was change in his pocket. Next slide. So Pio Pico um, begins to invest in business, in real estate. For a while, he, uh, he ran for uh, the city council seat in, in Los Angeles and won, uh, but he, he quit his term. He wasn't really interested in politics anymore. Uh, he was very much a, a, a businessman and a capitalist. In fact, in, the, in the, um, the, the equivalent of the Yellow Pages, he listed his occupation as capitalist <laughs> in uh, the, the 17, uh, 1860s and 70s. And he had all these business adventures. If you looked at him cross-eyed, cross he'd sue you. Um, at one point, there was the Los Angeles Gas Company had this smell he didn't like. He sued them because it was affecting one of his businesses. Uh, this is the, the, what is called the, the Pico Mansion. It was a, um, a, a, I think it was a 16-bedroom mansion in Whittier on his little ranchito. Hmm. Next. <coughs> Um, this um, right here is uh, the, the firehouse in, in the Old Town, uh, Los Angeles. And right next to it is Pio Pico's primary residence. That's where he did most of his business. Um, and right next to that, the far building, is the Pico House Hotel. Uh, he built this in um, 1870. It was the largest building in Southern California. It was a luxurious hotel. It had gas lit lanterns. It had a French restaurant. <coughs> It had a Wells Fargo bank there. It had a barber shop. People would come in to do business and they'd stay at this hotel. Uh, it cost him seventy thousand um, uh, dollars to to purchase that and construct it, and, and it opened in 1870. The next one. This is another picture of the Pico House. It's still there. Unfortunately, it was used for many years as a um, as storage. Uh, it's a historic monument. Uh, but now they're, they're opening it up, they're, they're, they have kind of like a, um, a little museum space in the bottom, and they're actually leasing out some other areas for, for businesses. Next. So, now we come to the, 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 the problem, and, and this was partially um, <coughs> the problem of, of uh, an unjust system, and partially the pro problem of Pio Pico, uh, using outdated business practices to, um, uh, to trust people, basically. This is his brother-in-law, Mary Pico Pico's sister, John Forrester. Uh, he became a Mexican citizen back in the 1830s. Um, he was uh, formerly a U.S. citizen. Married into the Pico family. Pico Pico made him a, a rich man. Um, as governor, he granted uh, his brother-in-law the Rancho de San, uh, San Juan Capistrano, and um, he took it into the U.S. Uh, um, period and became extremely wealthy. By about the 1870s, Pio Pico was um, losing money. The cattle uh, empire had uh, declined dramatically. Uh, there were a lot cheaper cattle coming in from Texas. And so, um, plus there were various droughts that were going on. And Pio Pico began to borrow some money. He took out a loan from John Forrester. Um, and he used the, that big ranch, the, uh, which is today Camp Pendleton, as security. Um, he thought it was just a loan, and in fact, what he signed was a deed of sale mm -hmm. uh, to sell that huge ranch for half of its value. It went through courts, but um, nobody could uh, dispute the fact that Pio Pico signed this, this document. And uh, he lost that, that, that ranch to his, his brother-in-law. Uh, Pio Pico did this two different times with his property, unfortunately, trusting people, uh, which was very common in the Mexican period. If you're a family, or if you're an associate for 15 years, um, you trust people with a handshake. Uh, and that just wasn't the way it, uh, it happened. Uh, he was defrauded out of his property. The last case was all of his, his hotel, his remaining, his ranchito, were all tied up in a single lawsuit. Um, the, the main witness um, said, yeah, I perjured myself. This is after the second appeal. Uh, it was a lie, Pio Pico had nothing to do with it, but 
Um, he had already given testimony. The guy died before the case was ended. Um, and the, 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 the judge actually in that case, which ended in 1890, said, uh, you know, um, a little bit of injustice is okay just to see that uh, this case ends because it's been in court for over 10 years now. Um, and so, by 1890, Pio Pico uh, was destitute. He only owned a, a horse and a carriage. He stayed with his, uh, uh, his daughter and a couple of friends. Um, that year, most of the people, he was already in his 90s, he was, there was no other Californians left. Um, Sunset Magazine uh, did this wonderful piece. They were lamenting the passing of the Californians, they called themselves. What are we going to do when the, the beautiful adobes are gone? What are we going to do when this culture is gone? They're fastly fading. And they interviewed uh, Pio Pico about that. Um, they invited him to the Chicago uh, World's Fair uh, and um, as a representative of the last California, Californian. Um, and Pio Pico wrote a scathing response to the, the Los Angeles Times and said, if he, they think they're going to put me in, the, in, a, in a tent for five cents a bit, like some freak to have another thing coming. He was naturally angry. Uh, I uncovered some, some letters where school children were actually studying him in California. Um, and th th these school children, I, I found out they were actually going around homes collecting nickels to try to uh, save for, to give to, to Pio Pico. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, he died in 1894. Uh, but um, there was a, a major requiem mass that was held in downtown LA, Los Angeles. And it really was the passing of the last uh, major Californian who, um, who died that year. And the passing of, of a new generation where that past of the Mexican past was uh, faded into um, you know, distant memories. And that is my talk. <laughs> If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to answer them. Yes, sir. Did he go back and forth between Baja and Northern California, Alta oh, California? Oh, yeah. He, um, um, when he was governor, he was governor of both Baja both. And, and Alta, so we'd go down there quite a bit. Um, he had a lot of business associates there. But um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo gave Mexicans the right to choose whether or not they wanted to leave California. And, stay Mexican or become a U.S. citizen, and he was born here. And he actually came to, to love the, the, the system, even though he was challenged at, at every corner. Other questions? Yes? Uh, well, thank you for that. That was very uh, informative. Uh, I wanted to bring up something for you to comment on. You spent some time uh, looking at the few people's father and paternal grandfather. There's a story with the the mother and the maternal grandmother as well. You know that one. Maria Gutierrez. Okay. Gutierrez and Feliciana Abayo. And that ties again to the uh, Afro-Hispanic history. Yeah. We found a record in what's called the uh, Mission 2000 database for the Anza expedition. This was uh, in Tumacacri, Mission Tumacacri, down with, near where the Anza expedition mm -hmm. came up. And there it lists her. She's just been a widow. Her, her husband, Gutierrez, was killed by Apaches. And we, we started to do some uh, research uh, about her and her, her birth. And lo and behold, for her, it says, uh, Mulato Libre. She's a free slave. So Pio Pico has that heritage on the paternal side and on the maternal side as well. Wow. So there's a, a, a book that's very good, especially for children, it's called Feliciana's Miracle. I brought a, a few pages from it, but it has her genealogy leading to him. Wow. And it's, it's about the matrilineal line of, of, of her and then leading to the, to the leaders, including Pico, Pio Pico, that, that she gives rise to. But it starts for us, who study uh, the Anza Trail, with this tiny, uh, Thing, her, her certificate, her entry in the mission records is Mulato Libre. She was free slave. <laughs> That's very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. I, I'll give it to you so okay. you can appreciate that.
Yeah, I mean, I, we mostly think of um, that side as being Spanish, and then the, uh, the one that, we, that everybody comments on is the, um, her grandmother, the wife of Santiago de la Cruz Pico, and, um, Maria Bastida. Um, she was listed as mulatto, but I didn't know that. What got you so interested in Pio Pico? <laughs> well, a um, couple of things. One, I grew up near um, Rancho San, or the San Pascual Valley, where that battle took place. And I always saw that there was a, like a monument about that, and I didn't understand what it was or who it was. Built. And then in, in college, I found out what it was, and so that sort of sparked an interest. And then when I was in graduate school, I, I just all these, all these students were doing these projects that are really super complex, looking at you know water in the 1700s or some little town, and I said, I want something that you know people are going to actually read and it's going to mm -hmm. contribute to where I come from. And so it was a natural, um, uh, just a, a missing page of history that I wanted to explore a little bit more. And just a dynamic person, you know, I mean, who spans that entire uh, uh, 19th century and really tied to a lot of the major movements. He was also, one of the things that I, I didn't mention is that he was, um, he was a big supporter of the Republican Party. He was the, the chairman of the, uh, the election for John C. Fremont in 1856 wow. uh, uh, for, for the Republican Party. And he was also a big supporter of the, the candidacy of Abraham Lincoln. He, he uh, remained active in the Republican Party until his death. Didn't he uh, pass laws that made uh, black people free at that time? Um, he didn't do that. That was made in Mexico. Um, but the Mexico uh, declared uh, abolition of slavery in 1829. Do, do Californians uh, in their schools still study the California history as a part of what they have to study? Yeah. I, I think they do, and I think some, some districts do better than others. Um, yeah, like in Santa Barbara, there's the Spanish fiesta. Yes, Fiestas, and they glorify the Spanish part, but they don't look at, you know, the Mexican uh, aspect and people, uh, you know, that came from the Hansa Trail. Yeah, in the back. Uh, can you elaborate in any way uh, Pico's feelings uh, again, again, that were separate from Castro, General Castro, in the, you know, in the early times when they were having the revolution of some battles in that case. Is there any history that you know of why Pico chose to be on a different side of General Castro? Um, yeah, it was all uh, elite families. <laughs> and the, the ones in the north wanted the power, and the ones in the south wanted the power. Um, Monterey, you know, was the capital, but Los Angeles was a much bigger town than Monterey. And, they, and Pio Pico felt this should be the, the seat of, of California government in Los mm -hmm. Angeles, not Monterey or Puny Town. Mm -hmm. uh, Monterey was the treasury and the, 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 the capital, so they were like, why do you guys have to have them both? <laughs> and basically, when he became um, governor, he named Los Angeles the capital of California, and took it away from, um, from uh, Monterey. And then he appointed his, his nephew as the treasurer of the, <laughs> of the treasury in Monterey. Yeah, it was money and power. Yeah. Yes. So, so how did he accumulate those thousands of acres? Yeah. How long did he serve that he, uh, his family, his family had no land to begin with. Yet in a roughly short period of time, we're talking hundreds of square miles of land. Yes. So as the, the, one of the things that, that um, the Constitution allowed in Mexico was for the states to determine if there was vacant land to determine um, who should have it. And it was kind of like um, you know the Homestead Act in, in, in the United States, where if you build and establish a farm on that property, then you can become the owner. Um, and a lot of Mexicans gained access to little small acreages of land, you know, tiny ones, 20 acres or something. Uh, but the elite gave each other these large, even if they hated each other, they, they knew that that was just simply the norm. And in fact, um, Pio Pico um, waged a war against one of the northern governors uh, named uh, Juan Alvarado. 
and um, <clears throat> Alvarado was victorious. And um, to mend uh, things, he, he granted uh, Pio Pico uh, the Rancho Santa Margarita, which is the 134,000 acre ranch. So even though Pico tried to unseat him, the norm amongst these families was that um, you give each other lands to make amends. Plus, uh, Pio Pico was the godfather to um, Alvarado's child. <coughs> and so uh, they were, even though they were on different si uh, ends of the political spectrum, they intermarried and they, they enriched each other. In that same vein, wasn't uh, Pico Pico uh, in, in power at the same time that the secularization was going of the missions? And so they had the, he was, who was in charge of distributing the mission? The mission. Um, okay. Well, yeah, they, there, was, there was a national secular, secularization law coming from Mexico City, mm -hmm. uh, which dictated that each area of Mexico that had missions had to come up with a plan of their own, which, which was representative of their region. And so in, in California, what they did is, uh, you know, they would appoint um, uh, secular administrators to govern over the, the, the missions. And they basically keep the missionary out. And so again, that meant big money because you put your cows on the ranch. So all of the elite families, they just appointed each other administrators of these of, of these lands. Pio Pico was a member of the uh, of the statewide uh, yeah. Senate. But as, as I read some of the deeds, it's all saying, Granted by Pio Pico, that you know, uh, some of the ranches yeah. up here. Well, um, secularization is, is a little bit different than that. What he did, uh, what secularization did, is it didn't give them the land, but they were able to utilize it. Oh. What they were supposed to do was build revenue for the, um, the state government. Uh, but because of the United States were coming, uh, um, Pio Pico sold them off to, to uh, make money, to raise money for the protection of California. Okay. Uh, but most of the debt, uh, the ranches were so indebted that most people didn't want to take them on. So some of them were just basically giving them away. If you take care of this debt, you can have it. <coughs> that type of thing. Yes. Where did he get the title Don? <laughs> That's uh, anybody who's uh, like property. People call me Don Carlos. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a term of respect. Any of his descendants or anything after him? Yes, um, I, I was in contact with a couple of people in Los Angeles. Um, a person in Bolivar and in Sinaloa, the, the, the Picos are still there, part of that uh, family. Um, there are, I want to say, 50 Picos related to him that still live in the East Los Angeles region. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, you know, some people believe that Pio Pico had, uh, you know, there, there's a new theory that's come out that if you look at uh, him right here, he looks like a typical person, but if you go back to that early slide, he has some uh, strange thing going on with his, his face. They believe that he had some sort of uh, sickness as a young man that prevented him, uh, made him sterile, and, and he, uh, which also made it so that he couldn't grow a beard. Uh, I forgot what it's called, but um, he never had a, a, a wife, a children with his wife. She died relatively young. He had a, he had a son out of wedlock or a daughter out of wedlock before his wife died. So he was an, he was a womanizer and a cheat. Uh, and then he had um, some children with a, a couple of other women after that as well. So, um, I'm not sure. You know, I, that's a character flaw. Perhaps, but very little was written about that. There was no letters, you know. I mean, um, I saw a few things in the newspaper after he died, but um, almost nothing left on the record. And unfortunately, almost nothing left about his wife. Um, it was all, all, a lot of it was business, some letters to his sisters and stuff. There was no oral history? There's, uh, you know, you know there's, a, there's a few people that are still confused about it within the Pico family. And there's a woman uh, that I'm talking to right now. She's asking all kinds of questions if I've seen anything in the archives and, and whatnot. 
but um, he did recognize his four children uh, by about the 1870s after his wife had died and, and it was safe to do so. Um, and he sent his, his son, he sent him to the University of San Francisco. So his son was lived a life of a pretty wealthy person in college education. Another question. 